You know, in the church year, uh, this Sunday of the Easter season is often called Good Shepherd Sunday. And so the theme is Jesus as Good Shepherd and we as the sheep. Now this first text in Acts 20 is a get a picture of the church in Ephesus, how Jesus shepherds his sheep, his people, by also using under-shepherds, pastors and church leaders, to shepherd his people to follow Jesus. Acts 20, 17 through 35. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they came to him, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I set foot in the province of Asia, I serve the Lord with all humility, with tears, and with the trials that come to me due to the plots of the Jews. You know how I did not hesitate to proclaim to you anything that would be beneficial for you, or to teach you publicly and from house to house. I have solemnly testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God, and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, now I am going to Jerusalem, compelled by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit keeps warning me in town after town that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. However, I consider my life as of no great value to me, so that I may finish my race and the ministry I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. Now take note of this too. I know that none of you among whom I went around preaching the kingdom of God will ever see my face again. Therefore, I solemnly declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all of you. For I did not hesitate to proclaim to you the whole counsel of God. Always keep watch over yourselves. And over the whole flock in which the Holy Spirit has placed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will not spare the flock. They will come in among you. Even from your own group, men will rise up twisting the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, be always on the alert. Remember that for three years, night and day, I never stopped warning each of you with tears. And now I entrust you to God and to the word of his grace, which has power to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all of those who are sanctified. I did not covet anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands have provided for my needs and for those who were with me in every way. I gave you an example that by working hard like this, we need to help the weak and to remember the words that the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the word of the Lord. And then from Revelation, we've been in Revelation the last few weeks, chapter 7, to get a glorious picture of the heavenly destination that our shepherd is leading us as his sheep too. Revelation 7, 9 to 17. After these things I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing in front of the throne and of the Lamb, clothed with white robes and with palm branches in their hands. And they called out with a loud voice and said, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne. And from the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, the elders and the four living creatures. They fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Now, one of the elders spoke to me and said, These people dressed in white robes. Who are they? And where do they come from? And I answered him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who are coming out of the great tribulation. 
They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Because of this, they are in front of the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. They will never be hungry or thirsty again. The sun will never beat upon them, nor will any scorching heat, for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. And finally, a brief passage from John chapter 10 about how Jesus is leading us to our heavenly home as we hear his voice. John chapter 10, 22 to 30. Then the festival of dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple area in Solomon's colonnade. So the Jews gathered around Jesus, and they asked him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I am doing in my Father's name testify about me. But you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the good news of our Lord. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us today. That we would hear from you. And that we would follow you. In your name we pray. Amen. Once again, happy Mother's Day. Mothers, grandmothers, I hope you do have a happy, enjoyable day. You deserve it. You deserve many happy, enjoyable days. Days off, days to be encouraged, because, you know, let's face it, you, first of all, you have one of the most amazing, miraculous vocations that God has given, you know, that a mother conceives and gives birth to a new life, to a child, and to raise that child. I mean, how miraculous and amazing is that? But then all the challenges that go along with that. So, happy Mother's Day. And thinking about having a happy day, I want to ask you, First mothers, are you happy? Are you happy as a mother, as a woman in your life? Or even all of us, are you happy? Now, I'm sure most moms would say, oh, there are so many happy moments to being a mother. I mean, giving birth to a baby, holding that baby in your arms, hearing it cry, first words, seeing it walk, first day of school. I mean, you can recount so many happy moments. And, you know, then they get to high school, and they play soccer, and then, you know, bittersweet happy moments, seeing them go off to college and then get married. Many happy moments. But you can also say, but there's a lot of things that happen in the life of a mother where it just sucks the happiness right out of you. Where you don't feel happy. You know, and, and it may be, you know, some women here that's like, I couldn't have a child. Or I had a miscarriage. Or, you know, just the demands of motherhood. It just, just sucked the joy and happiness out of you and you are discouraged and feel depressed. Or, or trying to balance work and, and being a mom and, and the challenge of that and feeling like you have to be superwoman to make it all happen. I, there are so many things that, that for a mother and a woman where you just, I just don't feel happy. Now what's the key to a truly happy, fulfilled life? 
And we can have those moments of happiness, but, but to have sustained, continual happiness. And not just mothers, but for all of us. What's the secret to a happy life? Now, Friday, Tracy and I and Michaela went to go see the new Marvel movie, Doctor Strange in the U- Multiverse of Madness. It's a very trippy movie, and it does get pretty dark. And it's interesting, you know, Hollywood, they paint the, a picture of a universe. First of all, the multiverse, where there's all these parallel realities and parallel universes, where there's supernatural powers and there's spirits and even demons, and, and they talk about hell, mention hell, but there's no God. What, what a bizarre universe that Hollywood paints. But there's one question that's asked several times in the movie, and it becomes a focus theme. Are you happy? The question's asked in the movie. Are you happy? And the antagonist, a, a woman who doesn't intend to be a villain, uh, she's a, a Marvel Avenger superhero, Wanda, I think it's Maximoff, and she has dreams every night. Now, oh, that gets trippy, where she sees her other selves in parallel universes with having two boys, Billy and Tommy. But it's only in her universe that she doesn't have children. And she's not happy. And she can't be happy in her life unless she is able to have those two boys. Yeah, and this is where it gets you know, really you know, strange and bizarre. I mean, she, she harnesses even dark demonic powers from what's called the, the dark set. And because she wants to be able to travel to another parallel universe to have those two boys. Thinking that then she will be happy. Well, you can imagine she's not. And she's devastated in the end. And so it's interesting, even Hollywood. What makes for a truly happy life? All of our attempts to try to get a hold of something we don't have. To acquire, to experience, to gain something we don't have. And to make it happen on our own ends in emptiness and devastation. There is no true lasting happiness. Except for that which Jesus gives us. The life that he leads us into as our good shepherd. That we be led by him into the life that is truly fulfilled, truly happy, eternal life. Now, I want us to consider a brief part of our text this morning. This is in John chapter 10 where where Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. And he says, the thief... And he's speaking to the Jewish false teachers, and, and behind that, the true dark set, the true powers of darkness, the, the enemy and demonic forces. He says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He says, but I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. He's the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. And here in verse 27, he talks about his sheep, those who put their trust in him, those who believe in him. He says, my sheep hear my voice. He says, I know them. I know you. He says, and my sheep, they follow me. They hear my voice and they follow. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Now, I want you to notice something here. I give them, present tense, eternal life. Not future, I will give them eternal life. I give them eternal life. Present tense. What does that mean? Now, if I were to take a survey, kind of practice on my wife, um, to pop quiz. But if I were to give a pop quiz, what is eternal life? I, I think most Christians would say, well, That's what happens after death that, you know, death is not the end and you continue to exist and live beyond death. 
And so, oh yeah, Jesus, I give you eternal life. I give you the promise that once you die, you will keep living. Well, that, that's for after death. But, you know, we got to figure out how to live in this life, to be a mother, be a woman, be a business person, be a student, you know, whatever it is. But, yeah, we're going to have life after death. That's way over there. Okay, that, that's part of the meaning, good, solid component of it. That's not all that it means. We have a very small, diminished view of what these words eternal life means. It is so much richer. It is so much fuller. It's so much deeper. And especially as used by the Apostle John in his gospel, in his letters, and the book of Revelation. It's like Matthew, Mark, and Luke when they talk about the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of Jesus, which it's future, but it's also in the present. And Jesus, as John is, is portraying him to us, he uses the word eternal life to mean more than just the quantity of life or the duration of life. It's like, well, death's not the end. I'll keep living and I'll have more life after that. That's true. But it means the quality of life. The joyfulness, the peace, the happiness, the fulfillment, the blessing found in relationship with God. The quality. So I want to give you a definition based on what I see in the New Testament. What's eternal life? It is to know and experience the unending divine life. Present tense. To know and experience the unending divine life of God the Father through Jesus Christ. I'm going to put in there his son, our Lord, in the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Did you get that? It's about the life of God, the divine life of God, which is everlasting, which is unending, which is in him. That divine life to be in communion with the triune God. And when we're united to him, we share in that unending divine life. It's like he created us for this. He created a God-shaped hole in our soul and that we would receive and commune in this divine, unending, indestructible life. And so this eternal life in Christ fills us with an unconditional, unending love. It fills us with an inexpressible joy. Not just fleeting moments of external happiness, but a true, abiding, unending inner happiness or joy. Peace, a peace that surpasses all human understanding to guard and keep our hearts and minds in the sense that everything is okay. All is well with my soul. And finally, an unshakable, confident hope that we know where we're going, that we know our destination, that we know what God has for us in the future, and it's like an anchor for our soul today. In other words, true happiness. That's what eternal life is. I'll bet you have not fully grasped that, because we usually think of it as life that goes on and on and on and on after death and never comes to an end. But it refers to the life that is from God. God's life. An unending life that is full of joy and peace and love and hope. Now I can hear someone say, well, okay, pastor, that sounds nice, but you just make that up. So I, I want to show you a few passages where it's defined. And the Apostle John, who in his first letter is so ecstatic... You know, he's witnessed Jesus rise from the dead. And, and it's like he's stumbling over himself to say, I witnessed this. I heard from him. I touched him. It says, that which was from the beginning, which you have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have observed and our hands have touched regarding the word of life. That's what he calls Jesus. He's the word of the Father, the word that became flesh. He's the word of life. The word by which God created all things and, and brought life to the whole universe. He embodies life itself. And John says, that life appeared in the flesh. We saw him. 
We've seen them and we testify and proclaim to you, what does it say? The, what's in underlined? The what? Eternal life. That's what he calls Jesus. He is the eternal life. He is the unending divine life of the Father. He embodies eternal life. This life which was with the Father and has appeared to us in the flesh. We saw him, we heard from him, we witnessed his resurrection from the dead, him being alive. And so John's saying, we're proclaiming what we've seen and what we've heard so that you may have fellowship with us. So I want you to, I want you to partake of this. I want you to taste of this. I want you to receive of this life. And he says, and our fellowship, our communion, our participation is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And why does he want them to share in this? Why does he want them to receive this? So that our joy may be complete. You will know the true joy, the true inner joy that is the fulfillment and the happiness of what life is all about. What he designed and created us for, which is to be in communion with our creator, God and Father, through Jesus Christ. Now later in, in his letter here, he'll say, and we receive that in the spirit. Okay, later in this letter, 1 John 5.20 he says, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. In his Son, Jesus Christ. We're in him. That means we're united to him. When we trust, when you believe in Jesus, when you're baptized into him, the Holy Spirit unites us with Jesus, that his life becomes our life. He takes our sin, we get his righteousness, we get his holiness, we get his joy, his peace, the divine life he shares with us. Because he is the true God and eternal life. Whoa. He is God. And he is that unending divine life embodied for us. Are you beginning to get it? This isn't just some unending existence beyond death. This is what life, the life of God embodied for us, for us to share in right now, in the present, as a mother, as a father, as a student, whoever you are. This is for us to receive and taste of today in the present. So it's not just about unending life, it's about knowing God. Jesus in his prayer in John 17 says, this is eternal life, that they may know you. What's eternal life? Well, it's to live forever and ever after death. Yes, but it's to know God. It's to know what true, a truly joyful, peace-filled, full of love, hope-filled life is all about. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. And Jesus says, I'm saying this so that they may be filled with my joy. And you track it in John. Joy, peace, love, and hope are all connected to eternal life. This is the divine life. Not an earthly life that in externals we seek to grab a hold of ultimate significance. But it's in the midst of our life and everything we do. It's receiving an unending, indestructible life from God that truly fulfills us. So in terms of defining it, I'm going to leave you with this last passage. This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Notice, past tense. He gave it. It's in Jesus. It's in Jesus for you to receive right now, today, by faith. And so he says, the one who has the Son has life. If you have Jesus, if you've received him by faith, if you've been united to him by faith and through baptism, you have life. You have eternal life. It's a present possession right now. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Which is why we want to get the gospel out. Those who have not heard and believed have not received this. And there are those who say, no, I don't want it. They reject it. All right, no, thank you. I'll do it on my own. But he says, I've written these things to you who believe 
in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Present tense. Right now. In Jesus. Now, we don't fully experience it. It's for us to get a little foretaste of that joy, that peace, that hope, and to know by faith this is our possession. We have what he declares to us in Christ because we're going to go through so many valleys and mountains and, and ravines and, and so many hard, rocky places in life as sheep following our shepherd where we're not going to feel joyful. We're not going to feel at peace. And all these things are pressing against us. But to know on the inside by faith, this life is yours. You have joy in the Lord. Now, if these are kind of a definition of it, Psalm 23 is a picture of it. That Jesus is your shepherd who's leading and guiding you in this, into this unending divine life. And we can say by faith, I lack nothing. And that he leads our souls our hearts to a place of abundance. He causes us to lie down in green pastures. He said, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to give you joy. I'm going to give you peace. And, and in the midst of the chaos, I'm going to bring you to a quiet place. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores our soul. He puts us at ease and says, everything's fine. And he'll guide us in the right paths. And we don't need to be afraid. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. See, it's living in his presence. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And in the midst of all the adversity, all the conflict in the world, he says, I just abundantly bless you, like setting a banquet table of lavish food in front of all your adversaries to watch. Man, and you know what? I take the celebratory oil of fragrance and I just drench your head with it. And that's a picture of the Holy Spirit. I pour out my spirit on you. Your cup is overflowing. Now, there's times like, we're going to feel my cup is empty. Or you might even be, a, by nature, a half full glass kind of person. Is the glass half full or is it half empty? But I want you to repeat after me. My glass, no, my cup is overflowing. By faith, we can say that. My cup is overflowing with joy. My cup is overflowing with peace. My cup is overflowing with hope. My cup is overflowing with his love. That's the reality that we have in Jesus, that by faith we confess, and he gives us foretaste of that. So that surely goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. That's what he created you for. To live in his house, to live in his presence, now and forever. And we don't need to be afraid of death. We don't need to be afraid of disease or death when it comes. Because we know it's a doorway to life. As we get a picture in Revelation. This is like heaven 1.0. You know that when that day comes, when we do die, that unending life in Christ continues beyond death. Now here's the... The definition we're familiar with, it doesn't end. So that when you die, yes, your body goes into the ground and your spirit goes into God's heavenly presence. And we get this picture of it in Revelation. Where John looks, he says, I see this great multitude that no one could count from every tribe and nation, tribe, people, and tongue standing in front of the throne. This is what God wants. He's seeking to have people and to draw all people to himself from all nations, from all backgrounds, all walks of life. And John sees as they're clothed in white robes, waving the palm branch of victory in their hands, confessing, it's God through his son who has saved me. And then they're identified. These are the ones who are coming out of the great tribulation. The great suffering and hardship on earth. Who had a taste by faith. Of that unending divine life. But now when we die, we enter into a, a greater experience of it. In spirit, with our body on the ground. And we're given this picture of it here. But then the end of this chapter, it kind of gives us 
the saints who are coming into it, but then portraying the eternal destiny at the end of the chapter. This is heaven 2.0. Let's call it that. And you have to bring in other scripture passages that those who've died, who can Continue to live in spirit in the Lord's heavenly presence. And we who still are alive on earth are waiting for that final day when Jesus will come back in glory and he will raise our bodies from the dead and our spirits will be reunited with our bodies and we will live in heaven 2.0. His presence in the context of a new heaven and a new earth, a new creation. And I want you to see the character of this eternal life. It's about knowing your creator God. It says they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And that's why, first of all, we live in God's presence. So you have the picture of standing in front of the throne of God and seeing his face, knowing him directly. That we will share in the glory of God by ruling and reigning with him. The picture of serving as his priest kings in his temple. And that no more misery, no more hardship, no more suffering. He says he will shelter us with the tent of his presence. And there will never be any hunger or thirst ever again. The sun will never beat on us. But the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. Wait a minute, he's going to continue to lead us in all of eternity into greater depths of knowing the joy, the peace, the love that is in God. And the picture is of drinking in living water. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The picture is we will be satisfied with the presence of God. And that begins today. That begins today. Right now. That eternal, divine, unending life, we begin to taste of it today. Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. He says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd who laid down his life for you in death, who rose from the dead. And he calls us to listen for his voice. As he speaks to us through his word and by his spirit. And to be assured, he says, I know you. I've called you by name. I claim you as mine. I bring you to the heavenly father. Follow me. Mothers, fathers, young people, whoever you are. As hard as it may be, follow me. It says, I give them, I give you eternal life. And when you hear that, I want you to think of this. Jesus says, I give you the unending divine life of true joy and peace right here, right now. And you will never perish. So I want to close with a, a blog post that I found by a, a woman and a mother, Jen Hesse. But she wrote on May 25th, 2020, titled, The Key to a Mom's True Happiness. And you know what? This, of course, applies to moms. It applies to all of us. She says, before I became a mom, I pictured happiness as a gallery of chubby smiles, goofy faces, and sleeping babies nestled in their mama's arms. That vision crystallized into a deep, unmet longing when I couldn't get pregnant for months, then years And as I scrolled through my friends' photos on social media, the whispers of future fulfillment grew to a roar. Once you have kids, then you'll be happy. In his kindness, God redeemed my tears and blessed me with the joy of raising two sons. Though I was grateful to answer my prayers, having kids surprised me in a less than blissful way. As I labored to keep two young children fed, safe, and cared for, I realized my kids weren't filling my life with continuous sunshine. Darn it, why don't they do that? (laughs) Mothering made me tired, annoyed, sad, confused, and enraged, and sometimes all within the span of a few minutes. 
Happiness seemed fleeting like nap time. It didn't last long enough. The problem wasn't that my kids were terrible or that I naively assumed motherhood would be easy. It was that I was treating my kids like vending machines. I thought they'd supply doses of happy feelings whenever I wanted and satisfy my cravings for meaning in life. It's a temptation many of us fall for without realizing it. We forget our wellspring of abiding joy, what John Piper calls the deepest and most enduring happiness that flows steadily regardless of our vacillating emotions or shifting circumstances. Because when we expect our children to make us truly happy, whether through their obedience or success or their own happiness, we place our unrealistic burdens on them and promote them to a role that only Christ can fill. I'm reading one final section here. She says, Our deepest cravings for joy and significance can only be satisfied by a limitless source of delight. As the psalmist declares about the Lord, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore, Psalm 1611. Nothing in creation, even our children through biology or adoption, can fill us with joy more than living in relationship with our creator. This is what Jesus brought for us with his death and resurrection. Rescue from sin, freedom to receive grace, to walk by faith. The privilege to abide in our Father's love forever. And Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Sisters, we can't expect our kids to make us happy in a complete and lasting way. No person, hobby, job, or ministry can in and of itself. True, abiding, storm-resilient joy can only be found in Christ. He gives us a better way to view our children, to view our lives, and a better hope to sustain us through the happy and not-so-happy days and seasons of motherhood. He is your life. He is your joy. He is your hope. He is your peace. Amen? Receive that and walk in that each day. Please stand.